talk a little bit this morning about living in anticipation. That's what we as Christians do each and every day. We live in anticipation. Have you ever felt, though, that sometimes life wasn't fair or life is a pain in the neck sometimes? I think a lot of people have. Uh, we tend to get down when uh, we've disappointed others. We tend to get down when uh, sickness or something drags on and on. We want it over with right now. We want it over and back to normal and be done with it. Uh, we certainly feel down and, and feel bad when we've lost someone and, and someone that we love dearly passes on. Uh, I believe that everyone has difficult times. They have frustrating times in their life. Uh, imagine, and, and I think about this when I read uh, about Jesus and about his prayer. You know, he prayed in the garden the night before and none of his disciples would stay awake. Uh, he, every time that he went back, they were asleep. Can you imagine how he felt so alone and all by himself? Even his followers, even his disciples that uh, should have stayed awake and should have encouraged and should have been there for him, they just slept in, in the Lord's time of need. Uh, I marvel at Paul's attitude when and what he had to go through. Uh, the beatings, uh, the imprisonments, the things that uh, he had to do and had contend with and yet he did not give up. He, he, he was living in anticipation uh, for the Lord. He just would not give up. You know, we live in a crazy, fast-paced world. Uh, church leaders today get frustrated terribly as things go on in congregation. I read an article the other day, nationally, the average preacher quits at age 47. May not hold true for, for any particular congregation, but as an average, the average preacher quits preaching out of frustration at the age of 47. Uh, that's terrible. You have plenty of life left past 47 that you can work for the Lord. I can't imagine people, preachers, quitting at the age of 47. But you know, we have elders that quit, elders that give up just because there, there's a squabble or a disagreement. Uh, you know, when people are frustrated in the world today, especially Christians, when, when Christians get frustrated, when they get bound by something that's going on in their life, they look around, and they see worldly people around them and they see them enjoying life and not anything happening in their life. And they sometimes ask themselves, is, is being a Christian really worth it? You know, I look out and see everybody else just prospering and having a good time. And here I am having a tough time and I'm a Christian. You know, is it really worth it? Well, of course, the answer to that is, is yes, uh, it's worth it. Uh, you know, the wicked appear to have everything they want and more sometimes, but it shouldn't, should not influence the Christian. Just remember, the Christian knows the pleasures of, of, of sin are for a short time. Those folks that are enjoying what they're enjoying, they're just going to enjoy it for just a short period of time. What we're going to enjoy is the kingdom of God, and it's going to be for all eternity. I think if this world was... Uh, was all the Christian had to look forward to, then you might have uh, opportunity to think, I'd like to live like them, or I'd like to be happy like them, or I'd like to not have any problems. But you know, there's, there's much more than this world. That we have much more hope than, than what's in this world today. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and 19 says, If we have hope in Christ only in this life, we are of most men most pitiful. Of course, uh, we would be. If, if all we thought was it was over when we left this world, we would be pitiful. 
Uh, we wouldn't have any hope of anything else, but we certainly as Christians know that there's another life that follows this one. So what goes on in this life is but a short time to endure. Uh, we live in anticipation. We live knowing that no matter what comes our way, when it's over, we are going to be with God in a better place. Uh, Romans 8 and 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So nothing that comes upon you, nothing that happens in this life can ever be compared to what you're going to receive as a Christian, to what you're going to get. Uh, it's going to be so great, the kingdom of God, that you won't even remember the things that have gone on in your life to get you to that point. Uh, the Christian's perspective is really unlike that of the most people in the world. Uh, we know that we're just passing through. Some of the people in the world believe that this life's all there is. But we know that we're just passing through. We're sojourners. We're going to be here for a short time and then we're going to move on to something that is even greater. Why? Because our heart is uh, in something else. Uh, we have citizenship in heaven. We have citizenship in God's kingdom. You know, while Christians live on this earth, we do so, but we do it looking forward to the day in anticipation that we'll one day be with God. Uh, you know, th this hope sets us apart from, from the rest of the world. Those that believe that all you're going to have is what's in this life, they can't live with the joy and the anticipation of, of having something better. They miss out on the peace. Uh, that hope gives us the inner peace of that no matter what happens, we know we've still got heaven. And that's the most important thing in our lives. Uh, sadly, even at that, a lot of Christians don't claim the peace that they could have in their life. They let other things rob them of that joy. Even though they know that they've got heaven waiting on them, even though that uh, they know it's a promise from God, sometimes they let their joy be robbed and taken away from them by what goes on around them. You know, we have to live in anticipation. We can't live in fear and worry about everything that's going on to where it affects our life and our relationship with God. Of course, we're going to worry about things. Of course, we're, the things are going to come up in our life, but we don't have to let it eat us up and control our life to the point where it interferes with our relationship with God. Uh, it will rob our joy. It will rob our peace. It will rob our happiness. Uh, do you think God would want His children to, to be robbed of their happiness and peace not at all uh, John 14 27 says peace I leave with you my peace I give to you not as the world gives do I give to you do not let your hearts be troubled nor let it be fearful the Lord wants us to live as as peaceful and hopeful Christians knowing that the best is yet to come and it truly is. The best for the Christian is yet to come. That's why we live in anticipation for it. We know that it's going to be better than anything this world has to offer. You know, the more faith you have in God, the more faith that you have in Jesus, it builds your confidence as a Christian. You'll find that joy. You'll find that peace. Uh, when, when you really trust and learn to love God, then there'll not be any, any reason at all that you allow all of those things to overtake your life. Not that you won't have them sometimes, but they'll not overtake your life to the point where it interferes with your relationship with God. When Christians are fearful, it, it's because they don't realize what they have. Uh, a lot of people, even Christians, have uh, made statements that I hope when I die, I'm going to heaven. That's not the hope that we have, and you're hoping you're going to have. The hope that we have is that we know we're going to heaven because God has told us that if we obey His commands, we're going to be there. That's the hope, not the hope that we hope we're going to make it. It's the hope that we have, and we live in anticipation of that hope. Uh, 
saved in hope doesn't mean I hope I'm saved. Uh, it doesn't. You know, we're all saved as Christians, uh, but that doesn't mean I hope I'm saved. You know you're saved when you're saved. It's a mistake for a Christian to believe that uh, that hope is just a desire to be saved. It's not. It's not just a desire. It's having that uh, place in heaven and God's kingdom. And God has given us that hope. Uh, the biblical word for hope uh, <coughs> does not communicate uncertainty. If you say, I hope I get this job, you're not sure. If I say, I hope I qualify to buy this house, you're not sure. You're just hoping and hoping that things are going to work out. But that's not what the biblical word means. Uh, it does not mean uncertainty. It does not involve the element of, of chance. It's not a gamble. The English word hope translated from the Greek is elpise. And it comes from a root word elpo, which means to anticipate. Look forward to it. Not, not hope for it, but to look forward to it, knowing that it's there. It's just you look forward to it. So when you say you have the hope, it's not I hope I'm going to be there. It's I'm looking forward to being there. So that's the hope that God wants us to have, and that's the peace that God wants us to have as a Christian. Uh, we're, it's a confident expectation. We know it because God has assured us that we have a place in His kingdom. Uh, we're saved people, Christians. If you look at... Uh, Philippians 4 verse 6 and 7 it says be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made unto God unto God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus if you look at Romans 8 and 24 and 25 it says be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God which surpasseth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus and then finally Ephesians 2 8 and 9 says for by the grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast we should know we're saved not just hope that it's a gamble that I hope when the day comes that I'm going to be saved we know we're saved we know and we should have that peace and that happiness in our life that expectation that we know we're Christians and we know that God is going to prepare a place and that when he comes we're going to be in that place with him uh, Colossians 2 and 13 says, When you were dead uh, in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of the flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven all your transgressions. Um, God wants to know that you're, wants you to know that you're saved. He says he's forgiven all your transgressions. Uh, he wants you to know it's not a gamble when you become a Christian of you having heaven it's just a when and when he returns uh, what does it mean to be saved well 1 John 5 and 13 says these things have I written to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life many people are lost and don't even know it uh, I'm talking about the world standards. What does it mean to be saved? Well, according to the world, it's just believing in God. You know, people say, well, I believe in God, therefore I know I'm going to heaven. Now that's a gamble. You want to talk about something that's not for sure? Just saying, I believe in God and I'm going to be in heaven? That is the biggest gamble of your life. It's the biggest gamble of your eternity. Uh, nowhere in the Bible does it say believe only. Not one place does it say believe only uh, and you'll be saved. It is a big gamble. Uh, religiously, the term lost re re refers to one's relationship with God being broken or unwhole. Uh, if you've not followed the commands of God, you've not fully complied with what God says to do to become a Christian. Uh, Jesus illustrated what, what that term meant to be lost uh, in several places in the Bible. Uh, a lost possession. 
uh, that lost coin, the lost sheep. Uh, and what about the rebellious son, the prodigal son who left his father? Uh, that's what it meant to be lost. They were separated and gone. Uh, when you haven't fully done what God wants you to do, uh, you can't live in the expectation of anticipation like God would have you to. Uh, those who have never experienced a relationship with God don't even realize what's missing in their life. How could they? They've never had it. They don't even realize what's missing in their life. Uh, Luke 19 and 10 says Jesus defines his mission on earth as seeking out those who are and saving them. And that was his mission. He came to save the lost. He didn't come for those that were not in need of a physician. He came to, to help and seek out those that were lost. Uh, people who are saved have a relationship with God. People that are not saved, they don't have a relationship with God. It's just that simple. Uh, I want you to remember something, though. It was not God that pulled away from mankind. Mankind pulled themselves away from God and separated themselves from God. It was God uh, who lost uh, that which... Uh, had been his, his dear son. He uh, allowed him to come to this earth to suffer, uh, to be humiliated, to be beaten, and to give himself in death and sacrifice for us. So, you know, when a wandering Christian, when the wandering child of God uh, returns, it's cause for rejoicing because that which was lost has been found. Uh, if you lose something that's dear to you and you hunt and you hunt and you hunt and you finally find it, what kind of feeling do you have? Whew. You have a wonderful feeling, don't you? Uh, it's the same way with God. That which was lost when it's found, it's a time for rejoicing. Uh, Romans 5 and 9 says, Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. Uh, those who accept God's reign over their life escape certain things. And that's the punishment of God. And that's some of the wonderful things that we experience as a child of God. We not only get and are assured of a home in heaven, but we're assured that we're going to escape the eternal punishment that God has put into place for those who are lost, that don't come back and correct that spiritual condition between themselves and God. 1 Thessalonians 1, beginning with verse 9, says, For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with them, how we turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues from the wrath to come. So being a Christian, certainly uh, we don't hope that we're not going to go through that punishment. We know we're not going to go through that punishment. God's wrath will result in those who rebel against Him, those who that have left Him, those whose relationship has separated themselves from God. Second, second, second Thessalonians 1 beginning with verse 7 says uh, when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now it, as great as heaven is and as great as heaven sounds this is on the very other side of that pendulum. As great as heaven is, this is how bad it, it is. Uh, they'll be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from His glory and His power. It's from one extreme to the other. Can you imagine the wonders and the, uh, the beauty and contentment and joy and happiness in heaven? And then think about the torment and the destruction that's going to be... Uh, everlasting for those who have separated themselves from God. Uh, why is it is being separated from God so such a bad thing? Well, it separates you not only from 
everything that God could do for you and help you with, but it also doesn't give you the knowledge and the hope that we have in heaven, the anticipation of living with God. Uh, it's a bad thing. Uh, God gives blessings to all people. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, my neighbor's not a Christian, and yet I think God still blesses him, you know. And I work hard every day, and I just don't seem to get the blessings that my neighbor gets. Well, uh, Matthew 5 and 45 says he shines the sun and gives the rain to evil and good a lot. You know, it rains on the just and the unjust, good and bad. Good and bad. Uh, Acts 17, 26 says, In God we live and move and have our every being. Uh, you know, God is concerned about everyone, but he, He's really concerned about His children. And in the whole package, when He blesses and does things for His children, uh, since the world is mingled with, with bad people too, uh, some of those people get some of that blessings that God rains down. It just, you know, when it rains every day and everybody gets out in their yard, does it only rain on, on the bad? Does it only rain on the good? No, it rains on everyone. And that's the way it works with, sometimes with God's blessings. To be separated eternally from God, though, is to, to be where His blessings is not going to go. Now, they're certainly not going to be in this eternity of destruction. It's just not going to be there. Even if you were lucky enough to get some of it and you weren't a Christian in this life, you're not going to get it in the next. You're not going to get any blessings there. Not at all. Uh, all the evil we see on the news today, that's what's going to be there for all eternity. All the gnashing of teeth, all the, the murderous things, all the evil things, that's what's going to be there for all eternity. God's not going to have a part of that. Uh, Jesus promised to prepare a place for all of His followers. Uh, you know, the best thing about this life is that we can live in anticipation to see God one day and be with God. That's the best thing in this life. Uh, you know, uh, no matter what we go through in this life, in the end, it's going to be the worst thing we ever have to endure if we're a Christian. What we've had to endure in this life is going to be the extent of it because everything else is going to be great. Uh, John 14, beginning with verse 2, says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And 1 Peter 1, beginning with verse 3, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance uncorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Does that sound like it's a gamble for you? As a Christian, to have the hope of heaven? No, it's a sure thing. It's not a gamble. It's saying to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away. It's not a 50-50 chance. It's not a 75-25. Uh, it's a 100% chance. If you're a faithful Christian, you're going to enjoy what God has put into place for you. Uh, it's just the way it is. Uh, you know what? Saved people should have, a, should have an attitude that's totally different from the rest of the world. You know, I know we have problems. I know we have things that go crazy in our life. But we shouldn't lose our happiness and we shouldn't lose our joy. We shouldn't say, well, you know, we're down. I hope that I'm the Christian that it's going, God's going to let into heaven. If you're a Christian and you're a child of God, you're not perfect and you can be forgiven. But you're, you're going to be in God's kingdom. Uh, as long as you have that humble attitude and you, you pray to God and ask for forgiveness for the things that maybe you've done that you shouldn't have done. Uh, we're saved people that live looking forward to God's kingdom. That's who we are. That, that sets us apart from everyone else. We're looking forward for it and to it. Uh, Romans 8, beginning with verse 18. 
It says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. You know, there's nothing in this life that could ever be compared to heaven. Nothing. So when we have these things that, that we deal with in life, whatever it may be, uh, a lot of times we learn from these things and we learn a lot of things. But we should not let it get to the point in our spiritual life that it gets us so far and depressed and, and thinking that, you know, am I going to heaven? Uh, we're going to heaven. If you're God's child, you're going to heaven and you need to live in anticipation of being there. You need to know and look forward to being there. Uh, 1 Peter 1 and 13 says, Therefore prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's nothing by chance there. It's a fact. It's there. It's a promise from God. If you're a child of God, you look forward to it. It's going to be there. Uh, any, anyone who is not ready for the Lord to return needs to, uh, to be ready. You know, that's the chance. You know, if you live in anticipation, you have that knowledge. You're, you're living and waiting on, on being there. If you're not a Christian, you don't have that hope. Uh, you don't have hope in any, any form or fashion. You're just sitting back thinking, well, maybe God will have mercy on me. Well, guess what? There's nowhere in the Bible that says... If you're a worldly person, that God's going to have mercy on you and put you in His kingdom. Now, I'm not saying He couldn't. I'm just saying there's nowhere in the Bible that teaches that. But there's plenty of places that says, uh, if you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, and to follow His commands. And part of His commands is what we to do to become a Christian and to live and have and look forward to His coming. Uh, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You understand what that means? Paul's not perfect, but he understands that even though through his imperfection, God's going to get him there. And he's promised he'll get him there if we do our part. And it's not a hope. It's not a gamble. It's not a 50-50 chance. If we're a Christian, we're going to be there. Uh, it's the basis of what a Christian should, should know for sure, that you're going to heaven. You're going to be in God's kingdom. Um, Philippians 4 and 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It'll give you a much better life if you're happy than if you're worrying all the time or, or maybe having thoughts about, am I going to make it or am I not going to make it or I hope I make it. If you're a Christian and you're doing what God says, remember, your sins have been forgiven. They're remembered no more. You just stay faithful and you're going to be there. A faithful, saved person will go to meet God. Uh, Romans 8 and 1 says, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful thing. Uh, if you're a faithful Christian, there's no condemnation. You're in good standing with God. Uh, that saved person can stand before God with all confidence. Uh, I'll give you a last scripture here. 1 John 4, beginning with verse 14. It says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we know, uh, or have known and believed the love that God hath to us, because God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love Him because He first loved us. When one is secure in their relationship with God, he doesn't feel any fear. 
We don't have to feel any fear. If I'm secure in my relationship with God, I don't have to worry about going to that place that I that's talked about that's a uh, wailing of teeth gnashing of teeth and destruction and fire uh, that last thing in my mind if I'm a Christian and I know I'm a Christian my relationship with with God is good I know I've got that reward coming it's written in stone it's God's commanded it he's promised it uh, you know even death can't separate us from that reward no matter what happens in this life, even death can't keep us from God's kingdom. Uh, we have a big misconception, and it's because partly that we don't know. It's unknown, and sometimes it's a little apprehensive and a little fear for us that, you know, we, we've been born and we know physical things and we've handled things and done things and lived our life, and, you know, we know we've got to die someday, but we don't want to. We don't look forward to that day. You know, we, we just really want to cling on to life and not go. Uh, we all have to go at some point. Uh, we don't understand the, the, or fully understand the capabilities of, of living and dying in, in its greatest respects, but we have to go through that doorway of death to get to, to, get to God, to get to the next uh, eternal home in heaven. Uh, sadly, not everybody that lives uh, when they walk through that doorway is going to be with God. It's just a reality. Uh, a lot of people don't have and don't live in that expectation and anticipation of being with God. Uh, I hope that you live in that anticipation. But if you're not a Christian, I certainly want to give you an opportunity for you to do what God says. Now, I didn't pull these scriptures out of the air. I just didn't make them up. And I just, it's not me talking. Look at these scriptures. Write them down. Go open your Bible and read what they say. You know, God says we're to hear the word of God. Uh, Romans 10, 17. And it says we're to believe it. You know, we not only hear it, but we believe. Sometimes we say, well, I, I hear this fellow talking this or this fellow talking that, but I don't believe a word of it. So it didn't do you any good to hear it, did it? Well, it's not so with God. We're to hear the word of God and then we're to believe it. And then it should cause us to be repentful, Luke 13 and 3, that our conscience has got the best of us. And we know that, hey, we've not been the best person and we need God in our lives. And Romans 10 and 9 says we're to confess Christ as the Son of God. You know, there's people today that believe in God and think they're going to heaven and still don't accept Christ as the Son of God and His sacrifice. But he says we have to do that. It's a must. And then Acts 2.38. When on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached that first sermon that was recorded for us. And those folks there were told and preached to by Peter and told him that you've killed the Son of God. You've put Him to death. You've nailed Him to a cross. It says that they were cut in their heart. They knew and realized from His preaching that they'd done something terribly, terribly wrong. Can you imagine being guilty of putting Christ to death, killing Him, torturing Him? They wanted to know, well, what can we do? What can we do? Uh, you know what Peter told them? Repent, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins uh, and be baptized for the remission of sins. You know, hear, believe, repent, confess, being baptized for remission of sins. That, that's God telling us what to do. Uh, you know, this is just a few scriptures, many scriptures in the Bible that back up every word on this plan of salvation. If you'll take time to study it and take time to read it, you don't have to take my word for it. But if you're a Christian today, and I hope you are, and I hope you're living in that great anticipation of one day being with God, but you may not be a Christian today. And if you're not, I would certainly hope that you'd want to be obedient to God, be obedient to, to His true word, and become a Christian, and have that expectation so that you can live with that great anticipation of being with God one day. If we can help you this morning, whatever way, we'd certainly like to do that. We'd like to stand and sing this song of encouragement. And if you have a need, please 
please respond to it.